Hi, this is Pete in Orlando, Florida. Thanks for tuning in. I'm an aviator by trade, but my passion has always been for steam railroading. I'd like to share with you in this video this beautiful Pennsylvania Railroad steam locomotive bell that I recently restored. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the restoration process, and I'm also hoping that maybe somebody out there can help me. Stamped on top of this beautiful locomotive bell are four numbers which represent a locomotive. The last two digits are a little bit unclear and I'm hoping that together we can solve the mystery. Thanks for watching. These screenshots are my first introduction to the bell. I found it online on auctioneers.com. The auction was held up in Michigan by Epic Auctions. Auctioneer Brad was very helpful in answering some questions I had before the bidding began. I won the bell with an $800 bid plus $200 in commissions. The next challenge was to have the bell shipped to Orlando, Florida. I used a company called U-Ship. It's kind of like Uber for shipping. You post what you need moved and shippers bid on the movement. In pretty short order, Tommy had the bell delivered safely down to Orlando, Florida. Here it is in my garage. The question that can reasonably be asked is, how do we know that this bell actually came from the Pennsylvania Railroad? Well, the answer lies in the iconic shape of the cradle or stand, the yoke which supports the bell, and the shape of the bell itself. These are all very classic to the Pennsylvania Railroad. As soon as I saw it online, I knew immediately where it had come from. Disassembling a bell is often a very challenging process. In this case, the bell actually came apart quite nicely. Here's some shots of the lead babbitt bearings. Removing the bell from the yoke often involves ice, fire, and lots of persuasion. In this case, there was a half inch set screw that ran through the side of the yoke and into the stem or very top portion of the bell. Also holding the bell to the yoke is the hardware which runs from the top of the clapper through the stem of the bell and secures on the top of the yoke. As you can see, there's lots of bits and pieces. In this shot, you can also see a Vulcan steam locomotive bell that I'm working on. Here's some Tuscan red on the inside of the yoke. The wheel on the bell is definitely not standard. It is, however, very heavy and was engineered to a very fine grade. The machining on it is excellent and down to thousandths of an inch. It's definitely a railroad quality modification, but more on that in just a little bit. There are a few things more fun and satisfying in life than stripping paint. Well, no. On the bell itself was a very ugly coat of gold paint, and below that, several layers of black paint. It took about four coats of paint stripper to go from the original brushed on gray rust proofing paint down to a layer of red Tuscan paint and then several layers of black paint. I took the finish down to bare metal before I started to repaint it by spraying on Rust-Oleum primer followed by two coats of bare gloss black paint. At the end of the day, I was very satisfied with the final finish. Before the bell was shipped, Auctioneer Brad sent me this photograph. For the first time, I realized that the original clapper was missing. I would need a replacement with a square fitting for the inside top of the bell. Additionally, to keep things authentic, I also wanted the replacement to line up properly with the strike marks left by the original. I sent a series of photographs and measurements to Brossomer Bells and much to my delight, they reported that they had an original Pennsylvania Railroad bell clapper assembly available. Once installed, everything lined up perfectly. Sometimes life just works out that way. Sanding the bell to achieve a mirror-like finish took a huge number of man hours. I used a DeWalt hand sander for the process. While there's more aggressive equipment available, there's that old adage that once you take it off, you can't put it back on. I'm just a hobbyist and I wasn't in any particular rush. There were a lot of dings and dents on the surface of the bell and I was careful to preserve them. I felt they gave the bell character. The metal is very hard, 
While it's considered a brass bell, it's my understanding that it's actually a bronze alloy. Also on the surface of the bell was a lot of very, very fine pitting. I wasn't sure if this pitting had been created by acid rain or during the bell's casting process. I eventually succumbed and had the bell sandblasted. It seemed like no matter how much sanding I did, I couldn't get rid of the pitting. I was hoping still to achieve a perfect mirror-like finish. The bell came back with a surface equivalent to about 220 grit sandpaper. Unfortunately, the pitting was still there. The bell would never be perfect. I went back to sanding with 60 grit sandpaper and ultimately worked my way down to 3000 grit sandpaper. Afterwards, I used my automotive orbital polisher with McGuire compound, followed by my favorite metal polish liquid, Flitz. It's a great product and really helps you to achieve a mirror-like finish on brass. I use it on all my projects and I've never been disappointed. Every nice bell deserves a beautiful display stand on which to rest. I crafted this stand out of two x four with an oak top and matching trim. For the sides, I cut granite with matching inlays. The top of the stand was stained and then given four coats of polyurethane. I use my bells as industrial artwork in my exceptionally clean and modern home. I consider these bells to be a tribute not only to the locomotives, but also to the men and women who served on our railroads, which were so vital to the success of our country. The bell was finally reassembled on the stand and weighed in at over 200 pounds. Here it is, shown with its new sister, a Mikado-type steam locomotive bell from the Southern Railway. I think they're pretty stunning. So what locomotive did you come from? If only a bell could speak. This bell was likely designed in the World War I era, served through the Roaring Twenties, the Depression years of the Thirties, World War II and beyond. The stories and the history it must have. There's a number stamped on this bell. The majority of visitors to my home believe that number to be 1188. Let's have a look at that locomotive and explore some of the alternatives. Here's the number stamped on the shoulder of the bell shown under the original gold paint. And here it is after the first coat of paint remover. And finally, after the bell was completely restored. So what number do you think it is? I happen to think it's 1188, which would make it a very special member of the large class of K4S Pacific type locomotives used on the Pennsylvania Railroad. Built between 1914 and 1928, primarily at Altoona, 425 K4S locomotives were produced. Designed to operate at speeds approaching triple digits, this class of locomotive was a keystone member of the fleet, operating on the 10,000 mile Pensy route, including the Allegheny Mountain grades. They very capably hauled freight and their iconic passenger trains, including the Broadway, Congressional, and the Spirit of St. Louis. At the time of her design, they were considered to be an extremely large and powerful locomotive. A handful of K4Ss received a fully streamlined design. Only one locomotive, however, was partially streamlined. It was known as the Skyline, and it was numbered 1188. Here's some photographs of her. If my bell is in fact from the Skyline, could it be that it was saved from the scrapper's torch due to its one-of-a-kind status? Shown here with kind permission from Jim Heron from Heron Rail Video, here's a clip of 1188 from his production, Classic Pensy Widescreen. Moving ahead to May 3rd, 1952, Derby Day activity at Louisville Union Station. K4s are working regular trains and Kentucky Derby specials into the station. The Bluegrass Special is headed by K4 1188. Built in July 1917, number 1188 was retired in September 1955. Now let's consider some other possible locomotives. 1133 is an option. Shown here, it's a small 060 locomotive that was scrapped long ago. Additionally, the bell appears to sit on the flat area above the bell pair firebox, and that's contradictory to the bottom curvature of my bell's cradle. 
Here's a similar class locomotive. You can see the different bell style. 1138 and 1183 are also options. Both were larger Mikado type locomotives. Here's a photo of 1138. And then there's that pesky wheel thing. Here's a photo of a standard Pennsylvania Railroad bell from Brossomer Bells. You'll note the vertical crank used for ringing the bell, which was apparently prone to breakage. Railroads were innovators and open to trying new things. Could it be that the wheel on this bell was a modification as part of the Skyline casing on 1188? Some may say that no bell on the Pensy ever operated with a wheel, and they may be absolutely correct. It would be a bit like saying that K4s operated with air horns, and obviously that never happened. Oh wait, here's a shot of K4 number 3755 with air horns near the smokestack. My point being that just as Mama used to say, just because you haven't seen something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. The Pennsylvania Railroad was very generous in donating their bells to various civic groups and churches. If this bell ended up in a church belfry, I'm thinking that someone out there should know about it. The big question is, where did this bell go for the 63 years following her retirement? I also have to wonder about the last coat of gray paint on the bell. If it was donated, doesn't it seem that it would have been repainted something prettier? I've been asked, how many miles do I think this bell rode during its career? Well, according to my research, the average mainline steam locomotive on the Pennsylvania Railroad did between 7 and 13,000 miles a month. If we round that down to 6,000, that's approximately 70,000 miles per year. Over a 40-year career, that translates to 2.8 million miles. My apologies to the purists. I did decide to add a little bit of red color, just for the bling thing. Forgive me for I have sinned. I did paint the inside of the bell red. Obviously, during its regular service life, it never would have carried any color. The numbers shown on the cradle and wheel are casting or part numbers and don't have any reference to a specific locomotive. When the bell was sandblasted, the number was covered up to prevent any further erosion. In this shot, you could see some of the pitting that I referred to earlier. If anyone has an original hex nut for the top of the yoke, I'd love to hear from you. One inch diameter, eight thread count, three inch across flats. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for. What's she sound like? <laughs>